Welcome to the Acton Institute and today's Acton Lecture Series event. My name is Stephen Barrows and I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at Acton, where our mission is to promote a free and virtuous society characterized by individual liberty and sustained by religious principles. Today's format will be a lecture of approximately 30 minutes, followed by 30 minutes of questions and answers. We are recording this event, so those who want to ask a question should raise their hand and wait for the microphone to be passed to you before asking your question. The Acton Institute has long been an educational leader in addressing poverty. Through our documentaries such as Poverty Cure and our convening experts and practitioners through our Poverty Cure Summit, we are delighted to welcome one of those practitioners today, Marlo Fox. Marlo has dedicated her life's work to the alleviation of poverty through practices that value relationships and promote lasting change. She co-founded Think Tank Incorporated in 2006 with the purpose of building awareness and facilitating collaboration among organizations seeking ways to promote more thriving communities. For 20 years, she has served in various leadership capacities in the nonprofit sector with the goal of fostering economic opportunity among under-resourced communities. Marlowe is particularly adept at developing strategic partnerships and aligning teams around a shared vision and goals. Marlowe has a Bachelor of Arts in Social Work from Anderson University and a Master's of Nonprofit Management, Certification and Capacity Building from Regis University. She has helped spearhead the development of various curricula, technology, and resources for churches, organizations, and community groups that want to become more effective at fighting poverty. Her dream is to help shift the way we tackle poverty in America through approaches that honor, trust, and partner with people who, with lived experience to lead change in their communities. So please join me in welcoming Marlo Fox. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you all. I'm excited about the topic that we will be exploring together. Uh, my hope for today is that we will not only have perhaps new ways to reflect upon this topic, but that this uh, conversation will actually be a catalyst uh, for action. So I'd like to start um, by posing perhaps a provocative question, and that question is, who is an expert? So I imagine a number of us in this room and watching online have probably spent a number of years, maybe lots of money in formal education to develop a particular expertise. That's important, right? We need those among us that have knowledge that they can share. When we think about intellectual knowledge, we don't think about solely the regurgitation of information, right? We think about knowing in a way that brings wisdom, knowing in a way that can offer skill. But we also know that there are many ways to know. We have intellectual knowing, but we also have relational knowing and experiential knowing. So let me give you a brief illustration from my own life. About 13 years ago, my husband and I decided that we were going to become foster parents. So this commitment of ours sent us into about six months of training where we learned a lot of information about what it meant to be involved with the foster system, to foster children, and eventually to adopt. Through that process, we were brought into a relational knowing. Our uh, knowledge expanded as we actually got to speak with individuals who had taken that path themselves. But I will say that nothing could have prepared us for the experience of becoming a foster parent or an adoptive parent. I was grateful for the intellectual knowledge that we had gained and for the relationships that we were able to foster. And I was given a unique perspective when we began to actually inhabit that reality. I would like to challenge all of us in the room to think about perhaps a similar trajectory in your own life. Maybe a, an, a chance that you had to learn about something, to connect relationally, and then all of a sudden to be drawn into experience. Now think about something that maybe has some emotional value to you. Perhaps it was when you got married or when you had children. 
perhaps it was a difficult time when you found out that there was a particular diagnosis, maybe a cancer diagnosis, for yourself or a member of your family. You experienced the evolution of what it meant to be an expert at a different level. Now, I want you to think about how this translates to our systems of poverty alleviation or how this translates when we think about developing poverty solutions. So many of the institutions that work um, on the front lines have lots of experts that know intellectually a lot about poverty, and that's important. In fact, they have experts that have relationships with people that are encountering poverty every day. But unfortunately, too often there's a gap in experiential leaders that are actually helping to drive solutions. So why is this so important? Well, let me offer another illustration from my own experience. Uh, about a year ago, my daughter um, actually began to encounter some health issues, and it began to impact her daily functioning. We didn't know what was going on, it was very scary, and we found ourselves in the hospital for the first time. We were admitted overnight on two different occasions uh, within a two-week period of time, battery of tests, very confusing and emotional time. Now, fortunately for us, um, this was a new experience. We had had relatively good health. No one in my immediate family had been hospitalized in this way. And you can imagine it was quite confusing for my daughter. What was interesting to me, though, was her own observations about the experience. And I'm going to read those to you. There are so many people that come in and out of my room. Every one of them asked me the same exact question and typed my answers in the computer. Isn't my answer from last time already in the computer? They put a board up on the wall to remind me what day it is and to tell me who will be coming into my room. I notice that there's a first name next to the housekeeper, aide, and nurse, but all the doctors and specialists have their last name and titles on the board. This tells me they're the ones that will figure out what's going on and tell me when I can go home. I'm intimidated when the doctors with white coats come in the room. I'm confused by the questions they ask me and the big words to explain what might be going on. Once, two doctors came into the room and right away I could tell that one of them seemed like he was right at my level. My mom called him a resident. When he and the specialist were in the room together, the resident wouldn't talk, only smile at me. It was like he wasn't allowed to talk. I wish he would talk because I can't understand what the specialist is saying to me. The nurses explain everything really well to me. I feel like I can talk to them. Now, she's my daughter, so of course I'm gonna be a bit biased and think, Wow, that's quite perceptive. But I think that just shows that she was able to see what those that were running the system were blind to see, right? So why does any of this matter? I was there for her, I could offer support to her, I could help be the translator, right? Well, the reason that this matters is that 88% of our health, health outcomes in this country are connected to genetic, socioeconomic and behavioral factors. Who was the most important actor in that room? She was, right? And so thankfully we got a diagnosis. Thankfully we got a lot of information to take with us. Now, I don't know if any of you have teenagers, um, but uh, turns out that good information doesn't always translate into good behavior. Turns out that's true for adults too, right? So what was most important for her was to feel cared for, was to feel connection, and was for somebody to communicate with her in a way that was meaningful, to tap into her own, her own strength, her own lived reality, and her own motivation for moving forward, right? This is why lived experience leadership is so important. All right, now I wanna replay that same scenario, but now I'd like to, us to think about it 
through the lens of a parent that may be encountering the same system, um, but they also are functioning under the burden of poverty. Okay, so they're also in poverty as they're navigating that system. Now, all of a sudden, we have other layers, right, that go on top of that reality. We have questions like, what happens if I'm here and I miss work? I can't be paid any sick time. Will I lose my job? Who will watch my other children while I'm here? Questions like, if I'm uninsured or underinsured, how do I know what tests to say yes to and those to say no to, and what will be the real cost to my daughter if I say no? There are social capital issues at play. Oftentimes, uh, people that are experiencing poverty may not have access to the same kind of social capital where they can talk to folks behind the scenes, right? They have a friend that works in the medical system or others that can help guide them through the process. And all of this combined, day after day, year after year, creates a sense of distrust and questioning, will I be given priority? Um, am I going to be well cared for? In fact, with all of these people coming in and out, who is my person? So when we think about that, again, I think it's an illustration of many of our institutions, organizations, faith communities, and many of our communities all across this nation. And so it provides a window into the common roadblocks that we encounter when we try to engage with people experiencing poverty. And it also provides a window of insight into what we can really do, principles and practices, to begin to get more effective outcomes. Now, as we think about this, I want to start out by um, zooming in to look at uh, our operating system that often guides the way that we approach poverty in America. We don't think about our operating systems much. I don't know about you, but I'm just grateful that I get up every day and I turn on my phone and it works. I don't think about all that's going on in the background that allows it to work until my operating system doesn't work, <laughs> and then I think about it, right? And so the operate, dominant operating system that we have goes something like this. If we want to be effective at addressing poverty, we have to have the right strategy, which leads to a certain programmatic output. Now, that's important, right? We want to have the right strategies. We want to be thoughtful and mindful. We want to have the right research that tells us what is best practice. Sometimes the right application is a program because that's what can be used to facilitate change. So here's the problem, though, with that being our sole focus, is that we can too often misdiagnose the problem when things don't go as we think they should. We think that, oh, maybe we just don't have the right strategy, or maybe it isn't the right program. So we come up with a new strategy or a new program. Let me give you um, just a quick illustration of this. Um, when we focus on people and process instead of strategy or program, we approach things in a totally different way. A team member of mine, she um, became involved in a home ownership program, an asset development program that was designed for first time home buyers and those on limited income. And she and her husband had both encountered situational poverty and she had had a long road and was, had gotten to the point where uh, she wanted to become a part of this program so that they could buy their first house. Now, again, the strategy, which by the way is informed by a narrative, was that we want to bake into this program a guarantee that those that are able to acquire the asset of home ownership will be able to maintain that asset through good financial management, right? That's important. That's essential. We all know that's essential, right? But the assumption was, the blanket assumption was, if you're a first-time home buyer, or if you have limited income, you must not know how to manage your money. Well, here's what I can tell you about my team member. Out of all of the people on our team, she's probably the one that I would trust the most to manage our finances. Her time in situational poverty created a resiliency in her that she had to be incredibly disciplined and learn everything she could to make every dollar stretch. So imagine being in her situation, trying to buy a home, 
trying to take a step forward and getting an email saying, you must show up to this program, and oh, by the way, make sure that you're on time. We need to make sure that we look good. <laughs> Imagine how that must have felt to her and what that did to her dignity. Again, on its surface, all good. But the focus was strategy and program and blanket application. It wasn't people and process. People and process is hard. It, it requires us to take a look inside our culture, take a look inside the assumptions and biases that we may have, the narratives that we may tell, take a look at our policies and practices and behavior and see how they align with our values. It's difficult work, but it's game-changing work. And it's what's necessary to help us overcome the roadblocks that we so often encounter when truly trying to engage and partner with people in poverty. All right. So let me unpack these just a little bit. When we look across the sphere of our community, these are common roadblocks that we found in working with a variety of organizations that are trying to address various facets of poverty. And these common roadblocks go something like this. There's a general distrust for institutions. We're gonna look at some data here in a minute. We probably all feel it. And we know that it's even more palpable when we're talking about people experiencing poverty. So people are coming to our organizations, our faith communities, our institutions, automatically with a sense of distrust. It's hard to overcome, right? The other roadblock is that we've got a sense of just social distancing. Now, that has a certain meaning today for us, but what I mean when I say there's social distance is that you can actually encounter and work with somebody experiencing poverty every day and still experience social distance. How can that be? Anytime we don't take the time to really listen, when we prescribe before really joining with, anytime when someone's dignity is not considered, a social distance is created. And we know that so often in our communities, it's really easy to spend time and hang out with people who have similar backgrounds to us. And so that gets brought into the equation as well. The third roadblock that we see commonly across the board is too often we have a kind of a top-down way of um, addressing poverty and developing poverty solutions. And so um, that doesn't give the kind of platform for people that have experienced poverty, experiential leaders, to be a part of that equation. So I want to share just some, some stats with you um, that reinforce these roadblocks. The first stat, um, every few years, Pew looks at social trust globally. Um, this comes from specifically the United States. And they ask a question something like this. Um, do you think that generally people can be trusted? It's a question something like that, right? So I want you to notice, um, for those that are making under 30,000 a year, um, we're looking at about, what, 17 percentage points difference to those making 75,000 a year or more, meaning those making 75,000 a year or more felt that people, yeah, they could be generally trusted at a higher level than those that were experiencing poverty. And so um, how does that dynamic impact us? I'm not, gonna, I'm not the expert in social trust, okay? But I, I do wanna share a quote from some folks that, that do study this. Feeling that other people can be trusted or having people that you can rely on in your life is worth a great deal. It has roughly the same positive health effect as shown in a series of studies as giving up smoking. Social trust is so important, and we know that that's a factor. Institutional trust, we also know that's a, a factor as well. You'll see since the 70s, again, across the board um, in the United States that we've lost a lot of our trust in institutions, again, across the board. Um, no surprise, we feel this, we know this. Um, on the left, you'll see federal, state, and local government. I'm sure we could have lots of conversations about this, but here's the point here is that you'll notice the closer the proximity to the people, the more I have access, the more my voice counts, the more that I feel that others have a stake in my well-being, the greater trust I'm going to have. 
All right, so when we think about these uh, barriers, I want us now to think about what might be the remedy? What, might, what steps might we be able to take to move forward to overcome some of these common obstacles? Well, this may seem common sense, but just because something's common sense doesn't always mean it's common practice. Is when we try to address trust barriers that are present, what's most important is the way that we value people and show dignity and value. Kind of replaying the story I, I shared earlier about my colleague that was asked to um, take a financial management course. The good news that came out of that was she actually uh, had a level of social capital where she knew some people on the board of directors of this organization. And so she was actually able to, to be vulnerable and, and go to that board and say, hey, look, this is how this experience made me feel. And oh, by the way, I'm happy to be able to work with your board and work with your staff so that you can continue to ensure that people have the financial management skills that they need, while at the same time preserving the dignity of everybody that comes through here and meeting them where they're at to make sure that you can help them along the way. Gaining perspective. Gaining perspective is one of the remedies to the social distance that we encounter. That means sometimes taking off our glasses to put on another set of glasses. For about a decade, I was involved in a community group um, in my own um, city. And this community group was kind of an organic group that grew up and, and our intention was to build relationships with people in our community that we wouldn't normally hang out with. Um, we were looking for a, a context or a place where we could um, forge relationships with individuals that were journeying out of poverty. And for those that weren't in financial poverty, that they could learn a little bit more about their community and how to be effective at joining together to make their community stronger. And so I got involved in this group and I became uh, cultivating, I, I began to cultivate some friendships in the group. And there was one particular individual that we began to cultivate a friendship. And I noticed that um, she felt like she could trust me and so she began calling me in the middle of the day and even at 11 o'clock at night sometimes. And my initial reaction was, I wanted to tuck my tail and run. This wasn't how friendships worked in my world. I had some pretty strict boundaries. I couldn't just leave work if you had a problem in the middle of the day. But I was able to take a step back and gain perspective and recognize there's some strengths in her rules of friendship. There's a loyalty that's there. There's a commitment that's there. And so being able to honor that and being able to honor the way that she needed to navigate relationships and communicate what my needs and boundaries were, I was able to use that perspective so that we could move forward and cultivate a relationship where we both could not only thrive in our personal lives and support one another, but also make our community stronger. All right, and build together. That was actually the theme of my talk, the title of my talk. When we think about build together, this, is, gets, this gets me excited, because that's where I think we can have some real influence in thinking about the way that we structure poverty solutions. Now, one way to build together is, again, gain, start by gaining perspective and doing some intentional listening. I'm a fan of focus groups. I think it's good to quiet ourselves, to humble ourselves, to listen to others, to ask questions that help us learn and make us better. But focus groups have to go beyond market research, right, when it comes to poverty solutions. It's one thing to ask somebody to give their opinion. It's another to invite them in to join in the solution. So when we say build with, this is what we mean. We mean co-design, co-lead, and co-labor. That's what doing with is. Let me give you a concrete illustration. Um, we had the opportunity uh, about a year ago to meet someone. She was a CEO of a senior living facility in Ohio. And as you know, it's been a rough couple years for these folks, right? And she had a number of concerns that she needed to manage, and one of those was her workforce. She did a great job at, at fostering a really healthy culture, but we know how that goes. It's really tough times to be able to support a workforce that's on their feet all day doing direct care, caring for um, some of our most vulnerable during an important season of their life. 
And many of these folks not only are care providers 12 hours a day, but they go home and they're care providers in their own life, all while living on the edge economically and trying to navigate poverty. And so this particular CEO, she had been talking to a colleague of hers, and he was saying, look, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a car giveaway because we're trying to incentivize attendance. It's critical. Each time someone calls off, it costs us in many ways. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a car giveaway, and if, and if any of our employees make it six months on the job perfect attendance, they're gonna, their names are going to be put in a hat, and somebody's getting a brand-new car. Genius. Wonderful. Who doesn't want a brand-new car? And so my friend Michelle says, I'm going to steal that idea. So she brings that to her company. She's really excited. She starts to talk to her HR directors and others about it. And word gets out that you're here six months every day. You could win a car. Well, she had created the type of culture where she was very approachable. She spent a lot of time on the floor with her employees. And one of them came up to her very boldly. And this is what they said. Michelle, it's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. People in poverty don't know what's going to happen over the next two weeks why do you think they can look ahead six months? She hadn't stopped to even consider that. Her thought was everybody needs a new car, especially if your car is not really dependable because you can't get a solid car. From that moment on, she made a commitment. She would no longer create a strategy for job retention without having a task force that really understood what it meant to come into work every day and to work these jobs and to navigate poverty. It was a commitment she made, and to this day, that task force has helped to guide and to build with. All right, as we get ready to kind of conclude this part of the talk and, and go into a Q&A, here's what I'd like us to do. Maybe some of you are in a position where you've got a notepad. If not, I want you to think about this a little bit and maybe take some time to reflect on this today. Many of you maybe remember Stephen Covey. He got, got pretty famous by a book he wrote a number of years ago called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of the things he talked about is that we all have a circle of influence. And even if we think our circle of influence is small, we can grow that circle of influence by stewarding it well, by stewarding it with integrity. So I want you to think about your own context. Think about your own context and your circles of influence. Where can you begin, begin to maybe rewrite how things are done within those circles? In my own story, as Stephen had mentioned, I am a founder and director of my organization, so that gave me some influence. And so we were able to take a look at the way that we did our hiring. And we made a commitment to always have people in our team that had lived experience in poverty. If we were going to be able to take the knowledge of the experts that study poverty and to connect that knowledge with real world solutions, how could we do that authentically if we didn't have people on our team that were helping to drive that? So we made that commitment. We also made the commitment on the board to do that. Sometimes these things are even more challenging when you look at your board of directors, but we made that commitment at the board level. We're going to be committed to having people with lived experience at the table, and that may mean we're going to have to take some more time to understand, create a, create a culture where everybody's voice matters and can be heard, and to, and to be able to offer some training for those that have not experienced poverty to, to better understand um, and navigate the rules of that world. The other thing that we did is we became involved in very intentional structures that began to move these values forward. So I mentioned one uh, circles group that I was a part of that built intentional relationships and social capital um, between people in the community that weren't facing material poverty and those that were. Another thing that we did was about two years ago, we initiated what we call the Change Leader Alliance. And what we realized is oftentimes experiential leaders don't have the same kind of investment in their leadership as others do. And so we wanted to purposefully invest in their leadership. 
to provide them prof with professional development opportunities and provide them with platform where they could lend their experiential leadership. That platform was everything from being on our podcast, um, um, contributing to blogs, training, and being a part of discussions where programs and strategies and initiatives were being shaped in the community. My other circles of influence was, of course, my family, my church, and the personal relationships that I decided to cultivate. The personal relationships, let me tell you, that's the hardest, isn't it? That's where it does get personal. Because we have to ask ourselves, are we intentionally pursuing relationships with people, maybe outside our tribe or outside our comfort zone? But for me, it's been incredibly enriching as I've gotten to know some amazing people that have encountered poverty and that have shown great resiliency and that teach me every day. So I want you to think about that. Think about your own circle of influence. It's my challenge as you leave here. My other challenge is this, is that so much of what I described in terms of our systems of poverty alleviation, those are reinforced by the stories that we tell ourselves. Sometimes we don't examine our own stories. We're not really mindful of our own minds all the time, are we? And so today, even if you can do this for 15 minutes, here's what I'd like you to do. I want you to be mindful of the stories that you're telling yourself. Every, every day that we get up in the morning until we go to bed at night, we tell ourselves stories all day long. We tell ourselves stories about ourselves, about others around us, about our community, and about others that are outside our tribe. We tell ourselves stories. And sometimes our stories may be accurate or partially accurate, and sometimes our stories are missing part of the full picture, right? And so think about the stories you tell yourself about poverty, about people experiencing poverty. Do you see value there? Do you see dignity there? Do you see leadership there? Just be observant of your own stories today. All right, I would like to conclude um, at this point by showing a short video. I mentioned uh, the Change Leader Alliance, which is an initiative that, that we launched about two years ago. Right now it's comprised of um, people in the greater Dayton area, but um, others around the country are looking to develop their own. And this particular alliance put together a video for us, and it's just a quick 40-second challenge as we leave here today um, of what building with looks like. So if we could show that video now. Look me in the eye, see me as a human, a reflection of yourself. Seek out my wisdom, for in my scars I have been refined and possess great strength. Value my contributions. Don't define me through my needs. Unlock the opportunities through your relational networks and seek to fight the discrimination and other barriers to access among your circle of influence. Recognize that I can lead in places that you can't so that we can lead together to strengthen our communities. So thank you. It's been a joy to be with you. I think at this point, we're just going to open it up for a time of Q&A. Got some microphones at both ends of the room if folks have thoughts, questions. Maybe it's on. I think it's very hard to relate to people who are different. It's very hard to change your life when you have a pattern that you're comfortable mm -hmm. with. It's very hard to try new things that you may fail at. And on the one hand, I can see the value. On the other hand, it's, it's really hard. Uh, do you have any thoughts or we'll say um, look forward and this is what might happen and, and how to start making it happen for folk that it might be hard for? Yeah, I think it's hard for everyone, and, and I appreciate you naming that, because that's the reality of this, is it requires a step out of our comfort zone, right? And so, but if we're chasing after effectiveness, then that's what's required, right? And so everyone's at a different starting point. So I think part of it is being cognizant of where is my starting point? If I feel like I've not ventured into this space at all to really begin to cultivate those kinds of relationships, it may be as simple as, um, within this next week, I'm going to go somewhere and just change my context. <laughs> I'm going to shop somewhere I don't normally shop. I'm going to 
um, just get out of kind of my normal rhythm in terms of where I go and where I access resources and change my context a little bit. So I think it's just recognizing where we're at, having a commitment to that journey. Um, I also think there are a number, number of people that can be bridge builders. And so go to where the bridge builders are. Um, you know, I know there are, are, are nonprofits and ministries all across Grand Rapids even um, that have some immense social capital in places that those of us in this room may not have a relationship in. And so they can be great bridge builders. Um, there's also some good training and some good books out there that help to just really kind of maybe give us some perspective, as you mentioned, on the realities of poverty. One of the things that Think Tank does, our organization does, is we offer a, a poverty simulation. Now, that was designed in concert with, it was designed with families experiencing poverty, so they shared their story with the intention of um, making that available to be able to give people almost a vicarious experience to be able to enter in to their shoes, to be able to expand their perspective and, and understand poverty more directly. So I think it, it's things like that. It's where am I out on the path? Am I committed to the journey? And where can I take a first step? Hi. Um, my question, you made a comment about organizations coming to you <clears throat> and needing training, the people needing training to understand. I'd be really interested to hear a little bit more detail about um, how you start with those people, because they're interested, but they're on a board, or like the woman you talked about at the um, assisted living or something, just where they were and then how they move forward so that they don't get tripped up by fear and bad, you know, bad former connections and things like that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, well, the training I just mentioned, um, the cost of poverty experience is kind of our starting point. That's our signature training. And so just beginning with that sense of uh, personal connection um, and awareness. From there, uh, we have what we call Cope Plus. And it's really taking a lot of these uh, principles and helping folks just do some um, self-assessment and where their organization is with all of these things um, and being able to um, get equipped to take a next step in those areas. And so there's a variety of things. Um, we have some online training and other live training. But what we find that um, organizations are becoming increasingly interested in is the Change Leader Alliance, is that some of those leaders can help be the best bridge builders, right? Because they can offer a unique perspective that's um, specific to your context, right? And so um, part, that's part of what we want to see um, all across the country is those kinds of alliances that can be able to be called upon to consult and train. Um, and so we've started that process as well, and that's been... Um, really enriching, I think, both for organizations and for those that are able to offer their experiential leadership. Our hope one day is to be able to, um, you know, then develop a, a training tool for organizations that want to develop their own Change Leader Alliance to be able to do that. So, yeah. One of the issues that we've come across as mentors to an immigrant family mm -hmm. is what I guess I would define as perceived poverty. Mm -hmm. When these folks came from South Sudan, yeah. they didn't think they were in poverty, right. living outside of Grand Rapids. They had more than they ever had. Right. Now they're living in Forest Hills, which is a little more affluent. So their understanding of poverty has been a challenge to us. What suggestions do you have for us guiding them into new standards of living that they're now exposed to? And yeah, yet needing a lot of help because their command of the English language is difficult. Right. Their culture is still African. We want to respect it. Sure. But yet help them grow. Any suggestions? Well, I mean, I think the most important thing is um, really learning a little bit about their perspective and honoring where they're at. And so um, one of the things that we actually talk about in our training is that um, – all of us, when we encounter any kind of change, there's kind of a predictive way that we're going to go about that, right? So behavioral science has studied this and looked at how we, as humans, change. And so the first stage of change is called pre-contemplation. In other words, we're not even thinking about it. It's not even on our radar, right? But there may be those surrounding us that see what they think is a need from their perspective, right? 
and they see an opportunity to advance um, and maybe get more skill or maybe, you know, again, have more material wealth or a whole host of things, right? More connections. Um, but if I'm still in pre-contemplation, again, a good argument's not going to get me <laughs> to contemplation or any further. So that's the hard part, right? And so all of this comes over time through relationship. Here's a tool, just as an easy tool we can all use. If I'm the one making the argument for change, person's not ready for change. When I start to hear them making the argument for change, then I have a place where I can partner. Um, that's a hard answer. That's probably not the answer you wanted. But I think that's part of the, the process of navigating that with them. And just learning from them where you can. Yeah. Uh, I have a suggestion if you want to get involved in Grand Rapids. Uh, we have the largest Congolese immigrant population in the country here. Mm -hmm. And Bethany Christian Services has been assisting the people in arriving here but they try to find families or churches to assist the people for six months. Um, it's been quite an experience, and in fact, we're on our third year of <laughs> assisting one family. Um, but uh, it's quite a learning experience as far as cultural differences, things as simple as time means a tremendous amount in the United States, yes. and being on time, yes. that's culturally opposite of what yes. they've learned. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Paperwork, especially from DHHS, is overwhelming. Uh, I consider myself pretty good at reading contracts, and I'll tell you, I just can't imagine them trying to read that paperwork every month. Uh, yeah. But uh, it's a good way to introduce yourself to uh, personally learning some of the things you need to do to assist people in poverty. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you for your commitment. You say this is your third year. Yes. Yeah, one of the things that I feel like is really absent in our culture generally is that we don't make long-term commitments to people anymore. You know, we struggle with this as a whole, you know, let alone making long-term commitments to people that are experiencing life maybe much differently than we are. So thank you for doing that. So you talked about people and process and contrasted that to strategies and programs. How would you parse out process versus programs? Like how would, I guess, how would you define process when you use it in that manner? Yeah, and they are intertwined, right? So um, just to go back to that same illustration that I used um, with the home ownership program, right? And so, um, the, the program or the strategy at play was we are going to ensure um, that all people have financial management. And so the process that was deployed was this blanket idea that it's mandatory, okay? So a challenge to that process would be to, th to look at the nuances and the experiences the people coming through and providing flexibility in the process so that people become the center point of that, right? So we're not married to the program requirements, rather it's a dynamic process that it's honoring to people. That's how I would, yeah, characterize the difference. Who else, anybody else? This is not a follow-up, it's a different question. When you were talking about the Pew study, yeah. I'd be really interested in knowing who they were interviewing. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Again, it's just a snapshot, and that's oftentimes all we have in the data. Um, but, you know, I think there again, anecdotally, I think it's something sometimes we feel is, uh, you know, the effects of that fractured trust. And I know anecdotally myself, I hear that a lot from people in poverty as they struggle with trust when it comes to engaging with organizations or, um, you know, that trust is usually a little stronger with the faith community, but it just depends, you know. So, yeah. I'm gonna try and frame this in a understandable way. I teach martial arts and one of the things we teach is how to de-escalate conflict. We, we don't wanna become physical, we wanna do, and, and the starting point for that is respect for the other person. Being willing to recognize them as 
for example, made in the image and likeness of God. Yep. But that is really hard, especially if you don't have a trust level or you have some fear about you know what this person may bring or do. And, uh, and by the way, you can talk about it all you want, and the practice part or the implementation part is a lot harder. And I think what you're describing is engaging in a way that both demonstrates respect and uh, growing trust and things like that. Starting steps that you might recommend for, and I think you did a couple already, but I'd like to hear some more, please. Yeah, and, and I'm, that was a good, a good example, and, and I think it's worth saying that it's, it is a real spiritual journey, isn't it? Because we can say we believe that all people are made in the image of God, but our behaviors will convey what we really believe, right? And so it's it's a some of it too. I, I referenced here's you know here's our circle of influence. We've got to look at where our circle of influence is, where our starting point is, what context we have to live this out. But also at a very individual level, we got to look at our daily disciplines. And are we taking the time to really meditate on that? You know, to meditate on the way the stories that we tell ourselves, right? And to be mindful and aware. <laughs> when in reality we're not seeing all people as made in the image. I think it's part of our faith commitment to do that, right? Um, so as far as any more I would add to that, I, I just I think we have an opportunity to look at this through the lens of just the various layers of our experience. So individually, what am I doing in my own spiritual journey to be mindful of where I'm at in my head and heart when it comes to people, right? But then, again, at the next layer, what can I do to maybe expand my circle and get equipped in order to build relationships effectively? Um, so I, I think it's that. It's looking at all of your life rhythms, everything from individually to corporately, and really, truly assessing where you're at. I do have, and I'm happy to send it out, um, an assessment that you can do inside your organization or ministry just to ask yourself some questions, because sometimes these things are invisible to us, right? I mean, we think we may be, we may think we're conveying dignity and value, but um, that may not be getting translated in that way, right? And so uh, I do have an assessment, it's a tool that we use that you could use at an organizational level um, to help you begin to put this into practice, at least by knowing your starting point, because that's really important. So I'm happy to, to share that. I have one question. So you talked a little bit about the different types of expertise, and it seems like there might be times when lived experience and more technical expertise might be at odds, right? With your daughter, maybe she's at the hospital and she wants to be diagnosed by the nurse, right? <laughs> but she should really be diagnosed by the specialist. So how do you balance this kind of lived experience and technical knowledge? Yeah. Sometimes it could be at odds. Um, and sometimes there's really not a platform to connect the two. So for my daughter, it wasn't so much that she didn't want the doctor to diagnose her. Actually, she wanted to, the person with the most intellectual knowledge, the most medical knowledge, to diagnose her. It's just she didn't find a connection there. And the rules of the system said that there couldn't be bridge builders to connect the dots. The resident had to be quiet when the specialist was in the room. So again, that's a people and process issue, right? It's a people and process issue. So, I mean, I think a lot of what you're hearing me say is it's how we really foster relationship across those divides. Now, I am a fairly pragmatic person, so I'm going to say this here. You, I appreciate you saying, but this is hard. Yes, <laughs> this is hard. There's no single quick answer. And so, to me, the most obvious pragmatic solution in that encounter with my doctor, the specialist his specialty was, in this case, neurology. I don't expect him to become a specialist in talking to teenage girls. That could take him a lifetime to develop <laughs> that specialty. Right. Here's the thing. He had two assets on his team that he couldn't leverage because the doctor hierarchy and the rules of the game said he couldn't leverage them. That's the problem. See there? So it's not that they're at odds, it's how it gets facilitated, how things get connected that matter. Again, it's not just the strategy or the program, it's the people and the process that facilitate it. 
Anybody else? Yeah. I have one more follow-up question in regards to help through Bethany Services. The case that I'm talking about, we've been with him for 10 years. Wow. We're still there. He That's still awesome. needs help. They still need help. Yeah. How can we sense when we should back off a little bit because we're becoming an enabler rather than a supporter? We're wrestling with that. It's a current issue. Yeah, let me refer you to a couple resources. That's a common, common, common scenario. Um, the first part of your question, how do we know when, you know, a lot of it is just listening and you've got a 10 year relationship. So you're probably at a level where you could be a little more authentic and vulnerable than you could 10 years ago, right? That's a beautiful thing. You develop some trust. But this whole kind of enabler dynamic, um, I found a good resource to be, again, I referenced the change cycle. Um, that's something that is important to look up. I found another good resource um, to be the, the drama triangle, if anybody's ever heard of that. And so um, that just calls out what happens a lot of times when we find ourselves in helping relationships, when there is a level of power imbalance because one person has more resources or maybe has more knowledge of an environment or how to access resources. And so typically most of us that find ourselves in a helping posture are going to naturally gravitate to one posture or another. Maybe we are rescuers because <laughs> we see the need and we want to jump in to help and we're fixers. That's going to be our default posture. Some of us um, maybe have started out rescuers or just are kind of a little more cynical and we're more of the persecutor. <laughs> when somebody's not behaving and doing things the way that we think they should, we have a tendency to kind of come down on them or withhold support. And ultimately, the, the, when we get on the drama triangle, all people are harmed. We perpetuate victims and enablers. That's what we do. So that's a good resource because um, with that, um, they actually show um, kind of the, re the reverse of that, which is an empowerment triangle. And when you find yourself kind of enabling how to get off that. And so I'm going to hang around a little bit afterwards. I'd be happy to connect you with both those resources. Yeah. All right. Here. One more. Okay, good. Hi. Um, as someone who <clears throat> works in healthcare and potentially with like foster care, mm -hmm. um, you talked about your experience with foster care a little yeah. bit. And I was wondering uh, if you could talk just a little bit about that and um, like during your training that you had, um, and my understanding, I think a lot of the training comes from strategies and programs and like how to deal, manage the behavior rather than like the underlying right. emotional regulation and like sensory integration issues. Um, <clears throat> and I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on the, how that could be changed into like the people and process. Yeah, that's that good. That's a really good question. Um, we had a fantastic trainer. She did not sugarcoat anything for us, and I'm incredibly grateful because she was probably in a position where she needed foster parents. <laughs> so she could have um, sugarcoated if, if she choose, chose to. Um, I agree with you. Our experience was very much kind of helping us be able to more closely understand behaviors that were going to be present. And I can tell you from my own behaviors, or my own, my, own behaviors, my own experience, those behaviors did not surface, many of them, until almost a decade later. And so I, I think one thing is the degree to which foster and adoptive parents can develop a social network with one another, and that can be facilitated. I think in terms of um, the equipping itself, yes, quite often um, those, those kind of underlying issues are hidden. And you find yourself pretty quickly in the journey isolated. No one came into our training that had any kind of lived experience from the perspective of a foster parent, <clears throat> a birth parent, or a formerly adopted child. That's too bad. I would have wanted to hear from them. So, I mean, that's an immediate application, is where can we par partner with those folks with lived experience that bring a credibility um, <clears throat> and a perspective um, to those that are at that starting point of taking that journey. All right. Well, thank you all. It's been a privilege to be here.